Hey everyone, it's Joe. This is our last paper, or last lecture for the week. The title of the paper is Beta Amyloid Precursor Protein with a subtitle, Localization of Transmembrane Domain and Specificity of the Gamma Secretase Cleavage. It's by Tischer and Cordell. Okay, let's just go back and review what we talked about on Wednesday, because it's relevant to this conversation. Uh, we said that uh, if you have a vesicle that the main portion of the amyloid precursor protein is in the lumen of the vesicles, that there's a transmembrane domain, and of course the C-terminal sticks out into the cytoplasm like this. And I'm just going to use one version of the APP molecule. It turns out that there are even more than two that we talked about the other day. There's a variety of alternatively spliced forms. And so it's a more complex uh, issue than what we had said. But at any rate, the, the cleavage of APP to yield the A-beta fragment, which is the pathogenic fragment of the protein, occurs somewhere in here. So this is called uh, beta secretase cleavage. And we said that there's also gamma secretase, which happens here. And this length is maximally 43 amino acids long. So it's a pretty small fragment. And then we also said that there's a possibility that the fragment gets cleaved by alpha secretase cleavage. And if that happens, it yields a non-pathogenic form because it cleaves a beta. And if that happens, it's not pathogenic. So it turns out that the specific location for the beta secretase activity or the alpha secretase activity is not exact. Um, the cell seems to have a preference, but it could be an amino acid longer or shorter. Uh, so it's not absolutely specific. But at any rate, those two phenomena happen. And in this paper, what they're interested in studying is gamma secretase cleavage. That it turns out that there's cleavage within the transmembrane domain, and they want to understand more about the specificity of that process. As we've said many times by now, the APP gene, of course, produces an APP messenger RNA molecule, and we have previously found the start site for APP in humans and the stop site. And of course, if you translate that, you end up getting a full length amyloid precursor protein. And within that area, there's a transmembrane domain. I'm just going to make some squiggles to indicate that that's the case. And of course, those amino acids are encoded by the nucleotides here in the RNA molecule. And when this gets cleaved, it gets cleaved by beta secretase here, and it gets cleaved by gamma secretase somewhere in here. And this fragment ends up forming the A beta fragment. So this is amyloid beta, which of course builds up in the lesions in brains of AD patients. So in this paper, what they decide to do is play around with the amino acids of this transmembrane domain and see how that affects gamma secretase cleavage in the formation of the amyloid beta fragment. They are using a cultured cell line called COS7, which is a fibroblast-like cell that was derived from monkey kidney tissue. 
And what they do in this paper is they mutate the nucleotides. Oops, sorry. They mutate the nucleotides of the RNA molecule so that it changes a single amino acid within the transmembrane domain. And then they try to figure out how that mutation affects gamma secretase cleavage and the formation of the A-beta fragment. And of course, I don't mean to say that they only made one mutation. They made multiple mutations, but they did them one at a time. And we'll go through the paper and see what happened after each individual mutation. So now if the RNA that's been mutated is inserted into the COS7 cell and you add radioactive amino acids, when the RNA is read and translated into amino acid sequences, the amino acids uh, the proteins rather take up the radioactive amino acids and the protein then becomes radioactive itself. And they run that on a protein gel. Oops, sorry, let's see here. They run that on a protein gel. And of course, at this point they're invisible. You would obtain a banding pattern, but you can't see it on the gel because they're invisible. To the eye, but if you place a photographic piece of film under the cover of darkness onto the gel, the radioactivity from the protein band exposes the film, and then when you develop the film, the banding pattern appears. So they are looking at whether there is a beta produced and how much, whether it's a high level of expression, low level expression, or somewhere in between. And that, of course, is determined by the intensity of the band. So maybe you know, a thicker band. So I wanted to dissect out exactly what they did in the paper. And I think this would have been a laboratory assignment. So we're going to do a little lab today. Um, <laughs> I hope you guys will follow along. I went back to our original APP assignment where we studied one of the forms of human APP, one of the splice variants. And this is the accession number. I think you'll recognize this from our lab earlier on. And I'm just going to copy this sequence and then I'm going to go to PubMed, just like we did before, and I'm going to select nucleotide and then paste in the accession number. Whoops, that didn't work. Oh boy, let me try again. Okay. And up pops the same page that we looked at before. And of course, this is the full length amino acid sequence. So I'm going to select this and copy it. And then I'm going to open up a Word document and paste it into the Word document. And then I'm going to get rid of the paragraph marks in white space. So just bear with me for a minute. Um, edit find and replace and then I select paragraph mark and replace all okay and then I go back and I select white space and I replace all so now we just have a total linear string of the amino acids that make up human APP or this version of the molecule then once again I want to know where the transmembrane domain is because that's what this paper is about. They're talking about gamma secretase activity, which cleaves in the middle of the transmembrane domain. So we need to figure out where that domain lies. And so I'm going to copy this sequence 
and oops, I need to go back to Chrome. And I'm just going to type in transmembrane domain predictor. See what we get. Okay, so I used this one the other day. That's why it's purple, obviously. And it's a little confusing, but you have to just stare at it for a little while. And I'm going to paste in the amino acid sequence and hit submit. And it takes a moment to, to uh, process the sequence. Well, that was pretty fast. So the pink represents part of the APP molecule that's actually inside the lumen of the organelle of the vesicle and then the red is the transmembrane domain and then the blue is the tail the C terminal and I stared at this for a while and I realized that the important part here is that the TM transmembrane they say helix is from 684 682 rather to 704 so if we go back here 682 to 704 and of course we have to find that somehow which um, isn't that easy to do let me see if I can see it here I've stared at this for a while so it might be right here so if I select this and I go to tools and I go to word count no, 680. I was off by two. So, so it starts, must start right here. Let's see if this is tools. 682. Okay, so it is from 682, so that's this part, until 704 which I already know, because I, I looked at this before, is this L is 704, and these prolines I know are not hydrophobic amino acids, so they wouldn't be part of the transmembrane domain. And I'm just going to highlight that area in red. Okay, now I'm not going to select the entire amyloid precursor protein because they're analyzing this part right here. They want to know if they mutate any of these amino acids, how does that affect uh, gamma secretase cleavage, essentially. That's what they're trying to do in the paper. But I want to show you guys where the A-beta fragment is. And so I'm just going to select a little bit more of this sequence. Let's say from here all the way to here. Okay, and so I'm going to copy this and then let's see how I do in Illustrator. Okay, so now I've pasted this in, into Illustrator. So let me bring this over here. And I lost my color, so I'm going to select it's right, it's this L to this, this A is the transmembrane domain. And I'll color it red again. Now, I wanted to find the beta, the amyloid beta fragment. So now if we go back to Chrome, and we open up a new page. Oh, I want the single letter designation. Hold on, sorry about that. right here let's see maybe it's
it's on here somewhere. No. Oh, right here. Okay. So it's from DAE to VVIA. DAE VVIA. So DAE to VVIA right there. So let me copy this and paste this sequence and we'll line it, try to line it up a little bit right here. Oh, give it a little space here. Okay. And then finally I just want to copy this transmembrane domain again because this is what they're actually looking at. So if I copy this, paste it, and I'll line it up right here, okay? Something like that. Okay, so now let's just remind ourselves, let's see if this will work for me. So at this point, everything was going along pretty well, I thought and I got up to get a cup of coffee and when I came back I couldn't get my pen to work any longer <laughs> on the drawing tablet and it took me a day to figure out what went wrong I actually had to go to school uh, because I had a few more pens down there I mean these it's a stylist for the drawing tablet um, so I'm back and I have to redraw this but I'll I'll spare you the details of of redoing it. Okay, after many hours of goofing around with this, it wasn't the pen. It turns out it was some sort of auto updater on my computer, and <laughs> uh, that that uh, really wiped me out. So now it's uh, four thirty in the morning on Friday, and uh, I did go to bed. Uh, I just woke up early because I figured I'd finish my lecture off, and I didn't know how much time it was going to take to do that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we recall that this is this molecule here. Oh, great. Here we go. You guys will recall that this molecule is a fragment of amyloid precursor protein. I'm going to just copy and paste it, a little piece of it. So it actually, whoops, it goes on in this direction for a while towards the C-terminus and it goes on for a while in this direction towards the end terminus. But this molecule is the amyloid precursor protein. And then we said that this one is the A-beta fragment. And then this is the transmembrane domain. And they say in the paper that there's variability in where gamma secretase likes to cleave, but its very favorite spot is right after the second V here. So it says G, V, V, and right after the V is where gamma, secre that gamma secretase likes to cleave. So that, that's where it cleaves most of the time, but it turns out that it, there's some variability in that. And that valine is at, is at position 40. That is, it's the 40th amino acid of the A-beta fragment. So if you count it along from the first amino acid to this valine, that would be 40 amino acids. And I did that just to check and make sure that that was the case. So in the paper, they show you two schematics. And this is in figure one and figure two of the paper. And I'm going to try to set that up in my own way. I'm going to copy this. Okay, so that's figure one and this is figure two. 
and they show this same sequence twice. And of course, the red is the transmembrane domain, and the others are just the amino acids slightly outside that area. There are a couple of interesting aspects of this transmembrane domain. First, it takes about 20 amino acids to span a lipid bilayer, either the cell wall or a vesicle, for instance. Um, and this is 23 amino acids long, so it's a little bit longer. And I looked up the composition of this transmembrane domain, and all of these amino acids are hydrophobic, with the exception of these two threonines. And there's one, oops, sorry, let's see my pen. There's one, one right here, and there's one over here. Uh, those are polar molecules, that is, they're charged, they're hydrophilic. So I'm not sure exactly what to say about that, but obviously uh, it doesn't affect the transmembrane domain, and it must get inserted correctly into the lipid bilayer, because this is the wild-type version of the amyloid precursor protein. In the paper, they also label some of the amino acids that they're mutating. And one, their favorite, is valine 40. And then they mutate this threonine, which is at 48. And then they label this valine right here at 50. And then they label some over here as well. And you can take a look at the paper and see which amino acids they mutated for figure two. At any rate, I mentioned this earlier, what they're doing is inserting the gene for amyloid precursor protein into these COS7 cells. And there's a way to turn that gene on that makes an RNA molecule, that is the DNA is transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA of course is translated into protein, into amino acid sequence. And in this process, in this experiment, they used radioactive amino acids, and those amino acids get into, incorporated into the newly synthesized proteins and make them radioactive. And what they're trying to do is determine whether the A-beta fragment is generated by the process of gamma secretase activity. That is, if gamma secretase doesn't cut the molecule, then you won't see it in the results. And what they do is run the protein out on a protein gel, and then I mentioned they put a piece of photographic film over the gel, and wherever the bands are, they expose the piece of film, and then when you develop the film, you see the banding pattern. So, so this is figure one and two, part B, and that is the only set of figures that I want to discuss. So it turns out that they do the experiment and they have a control. And the control is no gene. That is, they don't put the amyloid precursor protein gene into those cos 7 cells. So, of course, there's no product. Then they have a wild-type version of APP, and they get a really nice band that it shows up that indeed the A beta fragment is generated. And they tell you that there, are, uh, they give you a few different size markers here. They say up here is 6KD proteins, and there's some stuff up here that we don't need to worry about. And then this is 3KD and the A beta fragment is 4KD. So they're just looking at this region right here. And the question is whether the A beta fragment is made and it is made through gamma secretase activity. So if it has gamma secretase activity, then the A beta fragment is made and it shows up in this gel, in this autoradiogram is what they call it. And of course, the control, without any APP molecules in there, is blank. So they have a blank and they have a wild-type version. And then 
they look at different types of mutations, like what happens when they mutate valine 40. And we'll get into that in a moment. But if some of the A beta fragment is made in one of the mutations here, then you're going to get a band. And of course, if very little or none of the A beta fragment is generated, then it's going to give you a blank. That is, you're not going to get a band. And so they, they look at this autoradiogram, and then they have a way of scanning it, and they can measure the intensity of this band, and this band, and this band, or lack thereof, a band. And, and then they can use a computer program to essentially measure the amount of of protein in each band and they built a table and that's what I want to talk about actually is the table so in table one they summarize the two experiments of figure one and figure two so wild type for instance whoops um, wild type they say it's just 100%. I mean, they arbitrarily assign 100% because you can't get any better than wild type in terms of A beta production. And then they show that you can have, here's the valine, and if they mutate the valine to a phenylalanine, then the amount of in the band for that mutation is less than a hundred percent and they they measure it and they say it's 81 percent so if you alter the valine to a phenylalanine then you get 81 percent of the production of wild type so a little bit less but but still a very significant amount and phenylalanine is another hydrophobic amino acid so if you change valine 40 in the transmembrane domain, which is a hydrophobic amino acid, and you change it to another hydrophobic amino acid, you still get a ton of A beta production. However, if they change the valine to aspartate or aspartic acid, which is the amino acid D, then you only get 3% of the A beta fragment being generated. So this is shown in figure 1B. I mean, that's the autoradiogram that they used to determine that. Then they show if you change valine 44, which is over here, 44, this one's 40, and you change that to aspartic acid, you actually get zero. Now, aspartic acid is a polar molecule, and it has a charge. So if you go from a hydrophobic amino acid to a charged amino acid, you no longer get A beta formation. I mean, only 3% or zero if you change valine 44 to a charged amino acid. So what they think this means is that if you alter those two hydrophobic amino acids, either valine 40 or valine 44, to a hydrophilic amino acid, that the amyloid precursor protein no longer gets inserted into the vesicle membrane. And if it's not in the membrane, then gamma secretase can't cleave the molecule to form the A beta fragment. And that makes sense. Then if they mutate isoleucine, which is another hydrophobic amino acid. Oops, what's going on here? Isoleucine, which is 45, isoleucine. 
and you change, which is a hydrophobic amino acid, and you change it to a hydrophilic amino acid, again, aspartate, you get zero again. But then if you change threonine, which is a hydrophilic molecule, let me, let me make my, let me erase this and make this a little longer and you change that to another hydrophilic aspartate again, then then you get 57%, so you get some, quite a bit, of a beta production and if you change it to phenylalanine which is a, a hydrophobic you get 46 percent so what they say is that they think that this threonine is actually outside of the membrane so somewhere in an area here this part is inside the cell membrane and if you change the hydrophobic amino acids to hydrophilic amino acids that disrupts the insertion of amyloid precursor protein into the membrane. But if you change those that are out here, it has a uh, little effect that, that is you start to get a beta production again because those aren't part of the internal portion of the transmembrane domain. I, I don't really know what to say about that either, but it's not a bad point. I mean, they might be right. Okay, one more point and then we're done. Let me just take away some of this stuff here. We don't need any of this any longer. And I'll take away this. Okay. What they then decided to do was to remove parts of the transmembrane domain to study the specificity of gamma secretase. I mean, is there a specific set of amino acids that the gamma secretase cleavage recognizes and whether it needs those amino acids in order to cleave the molecule? So they first started by just removing four at a time and, and uh, I don't know where they did it. I'm not concerned so much about that. You can look at that if if you want to. But for instance, they took out, you know, four, like here, one, two, three, four. And then in the next experiment, they took out this four. In the next experiment, they took out this four. So they removed four at a time in different locations throughout the transmembrane domain. And the bottom line is that in all cases, the COS7 cells were still able to generate the A-beta fragment, that is, gamma cleavage still happened in all of those different mutated cases. So that's interesting because obviously if you remove four, then the other amino acids have to shift over and I guess they fill in part of that transmembrane domain. If they remove a bigger segment like this, then they didn't have very much a beta fragment. It, I think it's in table two. They show only 9% of a beta formation. And again, that's probably because you're disrupting the, the transmembrane domain so much that very little amyloid precursor protein is getting inserted into the vesicle membrane. Like, again, it can be generated and it's floating around inside the cell, but if it doesn't get inserted properly into the vesicle membrane, that the transmembrane domain isn't in that location, then gamma secretase can't cleave the molecule. Finally, they take a transmembrane domain from a different protein, epidermal growth factor receptor. So completely different, this is a totally 
Of course, it's made up of a lot of hydrophobic amino acids, but it's completely different than the transmembrane domain of amyloid precursor protein, and they insert that into uh, the transmembrane site. So they remove this one and they add EGF receptor, whoops, receptor transmembrane domain, and the molecule, um, the, the gamma secretase works, and you make plenty of A beta fragment. Okay, let's summarize what we said. So if you take the transmembrane domain of amyloid precursor protein and you mutate some of the hydrophobic amino acids into hydrophilic amino acids, then you dramatically decrease the amount of gamma secretase activity and the formation of the A beta fragment because the amyloid precursor protein doesn't get properly inserted into the membrane of the vesicle. If you remove a really large chunk of the transmembrane domain, you have the same phenomena. There's not enough hydrophobic amino acids any longer to form a true hydrophobic domain, I mean a transmembrane domain. But if you alter the transmembrane domain by removing hydrophobic residues four at a time, or you simply replace the entire transmembrane domain of amyloid precursor protein with another transmembrane domain, gamma secretase still works perfectly fine. So there's no specificity whatsoever. The only requirement is that the APP molecule gets inserted properly into the vesicle bilayer. And if so, gamma secretase cleaves and forms the A-beta fragment. Okay, well, that was a long, that was a long stretch. It's about eight o'clock now. So that gives you some idea of how long it takes to put the video together. You gotta look at the paper and and <laughs> figure out what you're gonna how you're gonna put the thing together. Um, incidentally, I talked to a lot of the faculty this past week, and all of us would rather be in the classroom with you guys uh, doing this in person than doing it online. It's much harder, actually, to do it online. It, it seems like it wouldn't be harder, but it is much harder. And uh, so I wish we were all together. But at any rate, uh, the good news for me is that at 8 o'clock, I'm done for the day. <laughs> so um, I hope you guys are safe. And uh, please send me any questions. The three papers that we have next week are easier than the three that we just went over. So I hope we're going to have a go through this. Please, you know, like I said, call me, email me, uh, send me a text message, whatever uh, you need to do to please take a look at the new syllabus. And if you have any questions about that or the exams, um, I'm happy to answer all of that for you. And again, we will have some sort of uh, Zoom session so that we can see each other and chat face to face and go back and forth rather than, you know, an, an email question or a text question one at a time. So, Okay, you guys, uh, have, a good, have a good weekend, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.